Well, welcome everyone. My name is Agam Patel and I am the Associate Director here at UCR's Palm Desert Center. And it is my privilege to welcome all of you to this remarkable inaugural annual lecture in Jewish studies, the Mark Rubin Memorial Lecture in Hate, Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our Palm Desert partners who are instrumental in contributing to towards programming like this. If you'd learn, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about this, uh, we'll put a chat up in, in uh, we'll put a link up in the chat. So uh, feel free to check that out. Uh, I also want to thank the mighty UCR Palm Desert team, without which none of this would be possible. So thank you. All right, let's get started, shall we? I would like now to introduce the Maimonides Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies, Professor Michael Alexander. Michael is faculty in the Department of Religious Studies, where he regularly teaches classes regarding modern Jewish history, the Holocaust, and the State of Israel. His books include Jazz Age Jews, and most recently, Making Peace with the Universe, Personal Crisis and Spiritual Healing. He's a longtime partner with UCR Palm Desert in hosting the Jewish Studies Lecture Series. But that's his official stage bio. But beyond that, Michael has been a trusted and loyal friend and partner of ours. We've collaborated with him for several years. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, he is a true Renaissance man. And we are privileged to work with him on a continuous basis. Take it away, Michael. Thank you so much, Agam. Uh, Agam Patel, who, and uh, also Tamara Hedges, the director of Palm Desert Center and the whole team that is helping bring this event here tonight and has done this for us so often in the past and we hope to continue in the future. Let me just take a second to welcome everyone here. Um, let me start by welcoming very briefly, Mark Oppenheimer, uh, who, uh, Mark, we have a long line of esteemed introducers. So just sit tight, we will eventually get to the talk. We also want to thank Pam Rubin, who is here, who has so graciously allowed and encouraged us to set up this important annual lecture in her late husband's name. Pam is gonna have the last word of the evening. So please, uh, for those of you who can wait till the end, we're gonna run about an hour, maybe a little bit more. Uh, we'll try not to run too long. And of course, we'll have much more to say about our memorial honoree, Mark Rubin, in a moment. But, uh, and right now, what I'm gonna do is drop in the chat a YouTube link to a remarkable interview that Mark Rubin did for the National World War II Museum in 2018 regarding his wartime experiences as a captive of the Theresienstadt Nazi concentration camp. I, in my career, have heard hundreds of hours of survivor testimony, and I have to say that each and every one is different in recounting just the individual re human resilience to human trauma. So I'm gonna uh, drop that chat, that, that interview in the chat right now. And I will also be uh, right now introducing a video message from our chancellor, Kim Wilcox, who, uh, un who unfortunately can't be with us live, but he, because he's traveling to the regents this evening, but he very much wanted to commence this uh, inaugural event with his own message. So if we can play that now, that would be great. Welcome to the Mark Rubin Memorial Lecture. I can think of no more fitting tribute to Mark and his legacy than a time when we come together once a year to think about the world, its challenges, its protagonists and its antagonists. And I say that because of all my deep felt memories of Mark, the one that always comes through is community. He was all about community. Certainly here in the city of Riverside, the things that he did for us physically in terms of structures, but more deeply, he was about people connecting in ways that made the world better. Uh, he lived a life that uh, few can imagine, uh, rising from imme immense challenges as a child to great success. So as we gather today, I hope we all appreciate that this is in some ways reflective of the very best of Mark Rubin, people coming together to share ideas and connect. Uh, 
Okay, that message from our chancellor. And now we have something quite special. I wanna now introduce uh, our dean, uh, uh, our new dean, Dean Darrell Williams, uh, Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, uh, who actually is calling in from Washington DC where he's doing UCR business at the Capitol. Um, it is uh, appropriate that Dean Williams helps us in inaugurate this lecture because he in fact knows a great deal about documenting human trauma. Uh, Dr. Williams is San Francisco born, um, San Diego raised, a Stanford PhD in history, and a real Californian despite the, the fact that he moved away for a while, but now he is back in California. Daryl's uh, expertise is Latin American history and specifically modern Brazil, with his most recent focus being the re repercussions of slavery and emancipation in Latin America. Uh, uh, Dean Williams keeps one foot in traditional academic world by publishing books and articles, and he's a digital humanities person and one of the principal investigators involved in the enslaved.org online database documenting peoples of the historical slave trade. And in fact, I'm gonna drop that link in the chat as well, because it's really well worth cruising through a database of as much information as is available regarding named and unnamed people that we have any information about regarding South Central and South American slavery. So I will drop that in the chat while we introduce Dean Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone there. Um, I wish I could see you and I wish we were together. But nonetheless, I do feel, uh, as Chancellor Wilcox said, the sense of community. It's really an honor um, to be here for the inaugural Rubin Lecture. Um, I did not have the, um, the honor or the pleasure uh, to, to meet Mark, but um, I joined Chancellor Wilcox and the entire UCR community, especially the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, in expressing my gratitude to him and, of course, to Pam for their support. Uh, of these kinds of events and the intellectual and communal uh, gatherings that we have here as well. I am in Washington, DC. It's Humanities Advocacy Week, and I've been doing a lot of advocacy on Capitol Hill, Smithsonian Institution, online. Hopefully, I'm gonna be meeting tomorrow in the White House. It's to tell a story about UCR and specifically about Chaz and the humanities and how important they are at, um, at UCR. I've been talking about Spanglish and uh, the lived experiences of multilingualism in Southern California. We talked some about NEH-sponsored uh, work at enslaved.org, talked about some work in indigenizing UCR and along the chaparral, which is, takes creative writing and uses creative writing as a way to express pain uh, um, and remembrance for uh, United States veterans. And so each of these, um, these opportunities have been told against this background and backdrop of the social, social and um, racial reckonings that uh, became accelerated in 2020. And this was part of the conversation about where the humanities are in relationship to 2020 going forward. But it's also very specifically in the Ukrainian crisis. Um, President Zelensky addressed Congress uh, just as we were meeting with some members. And um, it's important to understand that it, in Chaz, and this is a story we told, we have the regional expertise and the languages, the comparative perspectives about warfare and about um, human suffering and also humanitarian efforts. And we talk some about scholars at risk among others in this case here. And I think the important piece to stress here in this uh, past week is that humanities endure through crisis, but also the humanities are here to get us through crisis, warfare, intolerance, and genocidal acts. And so I share all that to say again, that I'm very thankful for Michael for this opportunity in his role as a Maimonides chair and as his community in the Department of Religious Studies of course, at the Palm Desert Center for hosting this event and other events like it to gather, be a gathering space, both in person and also virtually. And ultimately, I'm grateful for, the, for this privilege that we have, the social investments uh, that we have at UCR and on the federal government and other places to create spaces for hard conversations about the human experience and its most difficult and painful expressions, and also at its moments of profound beauty and grace. So I'm going to turn things over back to Michael, who I think will then introduce our honoree and our speaker. So it's quite a pleasure, and I wish you all well. Thank you so much, Dean Williams, uh, for joining us at, uh, in the midst of uh, difficult travel plans and, and politicking, uh, but we really appreciate your, uh, your presence here. So now we're going to turn to Dr. 
Mark Oppenheimer, who is our speaker. Finally, we'll get to Mark, uh, who is in fact one of the funniest and happiest and most well-adjusted people and fun-loving and people-loving people that I know, which makes his choice to document the trauma of the Pittsburgh community uh, in the aftermath of the terror event of October 2018 even more interesting and in fact uh, haunting. So uh, Mark Oppenheimer, a journalist of many decades, written for basically every magazine or national newspaper that any of us have heard of. Uh, at Yale, where he, in, uh, he earned his PhD, he's currently director of the Journalism Initiative. He is one time editor and writer of the Beliefs column of the New York Times. He is podcast host extraordinaire for the Jewish talk show and Schmooze Fest, uh, Unorthodox, which is available through Tablet Magazine. I'm going to link to that in the chat as well. People who have not spent a couple of 30 minutes, 60 minutes with Mark and his team at Unorthodox listening to the latest regarding uh, Jewish life in America uh, are really in for a treat. I personally started my journey on the Unorthodox uh, 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 podcast with, it, with an episode called the Nose Job episode which was absolutely fascinating. But since then, there's, there's a lot of water under the bridge since then. I'm sure there are a lot, there's a deep pool of material there. Uh, Mark is also author of uh, a, a, a half a dozen books. I'm looking for my copies here. Um, he's uh, including, he is a co-author of the newest Jewish encyclopedia. He is the author of the Bar Mitzvah Crasher, which in its earlier form, I have it here, an original copy, uh, 13 in a Day, which is about the bar mitzvah in America. It's a great read. And then, of course, we have the topic of today's presentation, uh, uh, now a national bestseller, the Squirrel Hill, the Tree of Life shooting, and the Soul of a Neighborhood, uh, regarding the terror event of October 2018 in Pittsburgh, and the grief and the revival of that community in the days and months following. Um, so when I heard that Mark was working on this project, I basically begged him to let me see the manuscript. And as I read through it, I knew that I was reading one of the first masterpieces of, of Jewish American literature in this century. And I really do mean that. So let us let Mark speak a little bit. And I'm sure we all have a good deal to ask you about this remarkable book, this remarkable episode of American Jewish history. And I just want to say before we go directly, and regarding questions, we'd like to do two things here. If one has a question, a technical question or a question about Mark's experiences, please drop that in the Q&A. However, if someone, we also, this is a community event. So if someone should have some personal comment that they would prefer to say live uh, regarding one's own experiences perhaps that are either relevant to the Squirrel Hill episode or some other trauma moment, we do think of this as a moment for you to sort of say something if you would like to. In that case, indicate that in the chat and then we can put you up on screen to speak. This would be happening later during the Q&A period. But otherwise, if you just have a question, please just type that in the Q&A. And with that, I'll be quiet. Thank you, Dr. Mark Oppenheimer. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Professor Alexander, and um, I want to um, also again, you know, express my gratitude toward Pam Rubin for making this all possible, and also uh, to you know to Dean Williams and uh, you know everyone else, Agam Patel, Clyde Derrick, uh, uh, Tamar Hedges, everyone who has has brought us to this moment, who has brought us to this day, um, as we say in the Jewish tradition, you know, for for bringing us to such a time as this. Um, this is uh, we are concluding the holiday of Purim in the Jewish tradition, which is. Um, which seldom falls on St. Patrick's Day, but this year it does. Uh, two holidays when you're actually supposed to get very, very drunk. I have abstained today because I wanted to be at my best when I talked to all of you. This is my second time that I've received a kind invitation from UC Riverside. I've been out to Palm Desert myself live, um, and now I'm joining you this way. And I, I hope I hope next next year it will be uh, in person again or whenever, whenever we get to such a time. But it, it really is so nice to be with you. Um, I have written a book that people often assume must be incredibly sad. And I say, well, it is, but it's also incredibly hopeful. And um, Michael is right, Michael Alexander is right, that I tend to be an, up an upbeat uh, and cheery, sometimes oppressively cheery or annoyingly cheery person, which I think may have made me well-suited uh, to writing this 
book and doing this research. So here's what I'd like to do uh, for, for all, I see that there's 76 of you here, what an extraordinary turnout. And that, that's probably a testimony, not just to the work UC Riverside is doing, but also to the legacy of Mark Rubin. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk to you for maybe 10 minutes about how I came to write this book. And then um, rather than read from it, because I think that's not always the most effective way uh, to get stuff across, I actually wanna show you about a dozen photographs from the book. The book is illustrated with 60 photographs or so. And I wanted it to be a richly illustrated book. I felt that as much as my words can paint a picture, they don't do as good a job as actual pictures. So I actually have a, a slideshow and I'm gonna narrate the backstory. I'm gonna give you exclusive special backstage pass to the backstory of some of these photographs and why they think they matter. And then we'll come back together and, um, and I'll take your questions. Uh, and I wanna leave really ample time for your questions, your thoughts, your reflections. Um, so October 27th, 2018, the morning of the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history, when 11 Jews um, were murdered inside a building where there were 22 people. So half of all the people inside the building uh, were shot dead that morning. Um, the 11 dead came from three different synagogues. There was Tree of Life, which is what we think of as the synagogue where this happened. That is the name of the building, and that is the landlord or host synagogue. But Tree of Life rented space to two other congregations, very small, scrappy congregations. One, Dor Fadash, which means new generation, and the other one uh, called New Light. And all three of those congregations lost people that morning. So in one morning, 11 lives were lost, and three congregations suffered murders. That morning, I was in Newton, Massachusetts, outside of Boston with my eldest daughter, Rebecca. We were about two hours from home, uh, from our house in Connecticut. We were there for the bat mitzvah ceremony, the, the Jewish coming of age ceremony of a summer camp friend of hers. And we were inside all morning from about 10 until one in the afternoon at the conclusion of the luncheon. And as, as is the case in Jewish tradition, you, you try not to bring technology inside the synagogue on the Sabbath. You try not to use technology on the Sabbath if at all possible. You want, you want a day of rest away from your phones, away from telephones, away from TV. And so we did not have any news inside the synagogue. Um, surely somebody inside the building knew what had happened, but but if so, they weren't talking about it. It wasn't until we got back out to our car at about, um, again, one o'clock, long after the shooting was over, that I opened up my phone and I saw all these text messages saying, are you going to Pittsburgh? Did you hear about Pittsburgh? You know, what, what, what are we gonna do about Pittsburgh? And I had no idea what they were talking about. So I navigated over to my news app and I opened it up and began reading. I must have looked very, very stricken because my daughter looked at me with this panicked expression on her face and said, Dad, you know, um, what's going on? And I said, well, uh, there are some Jews who have been killed um, in Squirrel Hill. And she said, Squirrel Hill? She said, isn't that where we're from? And I said, well, in a sense, yes. Um, and I was surprised that she knew this because of course she's from Connecticut, I'm from Western Massachusetts, but she knew on some level that um, as, a, as an 11 year old then uh, that her, grandfather, my dad, was from the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And in fact, she may have known that he was the third generation to be from Squirrel Hill and a fifth generation Pittsburgher. Um, my, I have two great grandfather, I have two great, great, great grandfathers, triple great grandfathers on my dad's side, William Frank and Isaac Oppenheimer, who both settled in Pittsburgh in the 1840s and were among the first dozen or so Jews to make a permanent home in Pittsburgh. So um, I had a deep familial connection to this tragedy. And as I learned what happened over the next few days and, and tried to take stock of it, I realized that as a journalist, this was something I wanted to report on. But I had a very specific interest in it. And we can talk more about this if you want later. I, I did not want to report on the killer or the alleged killer, I should say. He has not yet come to trial. He's in prison awaiting trial still. Um, I did not have any interest in a project that I presumed would involve looking through the the darkest, most you know racist, anti-Semitic, white supremacist corners of, um, of the internet to figure out what had made someone so twisted that he would want to kill Jews because he believed that they were pro-immigrant. And that was the kind of, that's the story that emerged was presumably this was someone based on social media messages he put up who wanted to kill Jews because he said Jews bring in immigrants. So it was an anti-Jewish attack, but spurred by a general anti-immigrant sentiment. This was someone who came for all of us in a sense. 
And I didn't really want to spend a lot of time trying to get inside that mindset. Nor, interestingly, did I want to write about the 11 dead, each of whom was no doubt a beautiful soul who deserves a book of, of his or her own. But what interested me, for reasons you now understand, was the neighborhood. Because I knew, not only from my family history, but also from my scholarly work and my graduate studies, that this neighborhood was unique among Jewish neighborhoods. It has been about 30%, one third Jewish or so, since it was founded around the time of World War I. And that's a remarkable thing. That level of stability to be substantially Jewish, like you know, a quarter to a third or so uh, for a hundred years exactly, you know, from about 1918 to 2018, is unlike any other Jewish neighborhood in uh, in America. There is no neighborhood in Los Angeles that's had that kind of Jewish stability in San Francisco, not Skokie, Illinois, or West Rogers Park in Chicago, not the Upper West Side or the Lower East Side of New York. Wherever you, th not Miami Beach, wherever you think of a Jewish neighborhood, it either once was very Jewish and has since declined in numbers of Jewish residents, or it actually wasn't that Jewish until probably after World War II, and then it ascended in terms of Jewish residential uh, density. But Squirrel Hill has been this, this, in some ways, the most stable Jewish homeland in the country. So I got very, very interested in what would happen when the worst thing that could happen to Jews came to the best place to be Jewish, in a sense, right? What, what, what would happen when the most destabilizing event happened to the most stable place. And I was really, this, this was phrased very beautifully by David Tribman, the editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, who wrote, I think the day or two after the tragedy, um, that the worst anti-Semitic attack in America had come to one of the least anti-Semitic places because Pittsburgh has a strong history of really embracing and loving its Jews and other, and other uh, immigrant groups and ethnic minorities. So I began going to, uh, to Squirrel Hill to this neighborhood in the east end of Pittsburgh where this tragedy had happened, the, the Jewish neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Um, the, the month after the shooting, I made my first trip, less than a month after the shooting. And, um, and within 18 months, I'd gone about 32 times and interviewed about 250 people. And again, my question was always not what happened, not who the killer was, not who the dead were, but how this affected the people in the concentric circle surrounding and outside, but somehow related to the killing people who were one or two degrees of separation, people who were in the web of community in Squirrel Hill, but, but had not immediately been, been killed. Because when the mass media comes, when MSNBC and CNN and all the national networks come, they spend a day or two and they try to find out about the killer and the killed. But they actually spend very little time looking at how everyone else is affected. And in a tight-knit community like Squirrel Hill, everybody is affected. So that became my question. It was a, a question of, of you know, ethnic community, it was a question of demography, it was a question of urbanism, of, of how city life helps people cope and, and thrive. So, um, so again, I went about, I went 32 times, interviewed about 250 people, and ended up writing this book about the other characters, the ones who didn't make it onto the nightly news. At this point, I would like to take you to some of those characters, and I wanna, I wanna share my screen and show you some of these photographs. Um, and we're gonna talk about them a little bit, and then um, we are going to uh, come back together. So I trust that you can all see the cover of my book right now. And I wanna start with this photograph. Again, we're only gonna do about 12 or 13 of these for a minute or two each. But what's so interesting is that this book jacket right here speaks to the ecumenical interfaith nature of the community. Because what you see outside, this is a photograph taken outside Tree of Life, maybe two days after the killing in the evening. It's kind of a memorial uh, garden that has sprung up. And what you see are two kinds of, of symbols, right? Uh, that people have left there. One are candles, and the one is candles, the other is um, flowers. Now that's really interesting because we say, oh, of course, people leave candles, people leave flowers. But actually, they're very different kinds of symbols. Jews use candles for ritual and liturgical purposes. We light candles to, to bring in the Sabbath on Friday night. We light candles to leave the Sabbath on Saturday when it ends and re-enter normal time. We light candles to begin our holidays. We also light candles on the anniversary of, of losing a, a loved one, the yard site, the annual death death anniversary, as it were. You light a, a yard site candle. So candles are everywhere. It's not the case in Christian worship in the same way. Christians, by contrast, tend to use flowers. They use flowers to remember their dead. They tend to 
that deck their weddings with flowers much more so than Jews traditionally will. So already you can see this commingling of the flowers and the candles, which symbolizes in some ways the, the commingling of people in this shared community of grief. And I, I think that that actually didn't even occur to me until the book was already published. And I thought, wow, that was such a great photograph that the designer chose because it really it carries a lot of a lot of symbolic import. This gentleman is a guy named Greg Zanus. He died uh, in 2020. I had a chance to interview him before he died. He organized, he's an evangelical Christian from Aurora, Illinois, who in the mid 90s began traveling around the country, putting crosses at the site of a violent death where people had died either due to mass shooting or sometimes natural disasters like hurricanes, sometimes airplane crashes. And um, he founded a nonprofit, a one man nonprofit called Crosses for Losses which funded his work. Um, he became relatively famous. He was on 60 Minutes. When he died, his uh, obituary was in the New York Times. And what was so interesting about Greg Zanus, uh, these, by the way, are not crosses for the 11 dead in Pittsburgh. The, the names that he's painted on them are not Pittsburgh names. It's a photograph from elsewhere. But what's so interesting about Greg Zanus was that although he himself was a very devout Christian, he always tried to be culturally sensitive to the people who had died. So for Jews, he would put a Star of David on the front of the cross so that you didn't see the cross, you saw a, a six-pointed Jewish star. For Muslims, he would use a, a crescent moon. Uh, he had other symbols for Hindus and Sikhs and Jains and, and Baha'i. And he, he had a little booklet with several dozen different appropriate symbols, and he would always try to carve a piece of wood in that symbol and put it on the front of the cross if the person wasn't Christian. And he did this for thousands of people over you know, 25 years. He put millions of miles on several different pickup trucks that he drove into the ground. He showed up in Pittsburgh the day after the killings on Sunday, uh, October 28th, having driven nine hours straight through overnight from suburban Chicago where he lived. And, um, he, and one more just note about him, he, he did not think it was his role to place the crosses there himself if it was somehow sacred ground. He approached an Orthodox Jewish man and, and gave him the star the crosses with the stars of david on them and said would you place these on the property of tree of life because he somehow felt he would be violating the space so he looked for someone who looked visibly orthodox because of their garb and asked them to do it it's just an extraordinary kind of story um there is a lot of graphic art that happens in the aftermath of a mass killing many of you will have seen this um this kind of icon this symbol this design I was very curious who did it. It turns out it was the work of a Lutheran, lapsed Lutheran, German-American, non-Jewish, non-Squirrel Hill resident, again, Gentile Christian guy from the suburbs named Tim Hindus, um, who uh, was so moved by what had happened and so angry and so hurt that he decided that he had to design something. He was a graphic designer. And so he went home and fiddled around on his computer and he wanted to come up with a design that indicated that Pittsburgh embraced its Jews. So he thought, what's more, what's more Pittsburgh than the Pittsburgh Steelers? And he pulled up the logo of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and then he, and then he made it Jewish by replacing the yellow hypocycloid, that's what it's called, on top. It's like an asteroid or a star, but it's that particular geometric shape is a hypocycloid, I learned. He replaced the yellow hypocycloid with a yellow Star of David, and then he replaced the word Steelers with stronger than hate. And he posted on Facebook, and within, you know, within a few hours, it had gone around the world a trillion times, give or take. And, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers put it on their cleats. Uh, within a day, you saw posters in all the shop windows in um, in in Squirrel Hill, in the Forbes and Murray Business District. Um, and, you know, with this poster on it, you saw babies' onesies, you saw yarmulkes. It just became like the defining symbol of the tragedy. And again, done by a non-Jewish graphic designer, no relationship to Tree of Life, just wanted to help. The headline of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette the following Friday, speaking of graphic images and the ways that people heal and deal with tragedy, um, was the first line of the mourner's Kaddish, the mourner's prayer in Hebrew, Yitgadal v'yitgadal shemei rabah, reading right to left or Jewish direction, as I tell my kids, we call it. Um, and what was so interesting about this, running this Hebrew language headline, a, a Hebrew statement of mourning, which had never been done before in an English language American newspaper, as far as I know is that the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette didn't even have a Hebrew typeface big enough to do this. They had to specially create this font to do this when the editor-in-chief, David Tribben, came up with this idea. And of course, it was a terrific idea. And, and he, it was kind of taking a risk because most people wouldn't know what it said. And yet somehow 
they knew what it said. And they, people would got the newspaper that Friday, which was the fourth consecutive day of funerals. Um, there were funerals Tuesday through Friday, and they just started sobbing. I mean, they saw this headline and just it went straight to their hearts. It was one of the most brilliant, one of those brilliant headlines since uh, since Dewey defeats Truman in the pantheon of great American headlines. This is maybe my favorite picture in, in the whole book. Um, the Starbucks at the corner of Forbes and Shady, kind of like the central Starbucks of Squirrel Hill. There are two Starbucks within a half mile of each other. But a um, here's this beautiful Jewish, Jewish imagery that was painted in the windows um, of the Starbucks that has so many Jewish and Orthodox Jewish customers. You see a Star of David, a Tree of Life, and a dove, and the words love, kindness, and hope. Or in Hebrew, as you see the little Hebrew letters there, Ahava, Chesed, and Tikva. Who did this? Was it some Jewish artist? No. Uh, the lapsed Presbyterian manager of the Starbucks, Mizelle, Michelle, <coughs> excuse me, Nicole Lysot, um, call, excuse me, Melissa Lysot, called her Roman Catholic friend, Nicole Flannery, and said, I want to do something for my Jewish customers. Um, Mo Melissa Lysot had been the manager the morning that this happened. And this is, by the way, like less than half a mile from Tree of Life. So people were coming in, they were using it as kind of an outpost, like to it was, it was not so far outside the yellow tape, the yellow police tape. And Melissa Lysot was there kind of presiding over the Starbucks all morning. And when the whole situation was cleaned up, she wanted to do something of public art to remember um, the day by. So she called her friend, Nicole, who um, is a, a, an art teacher and an artist, Roman Catholic, and said, will you do something for the Jews, for my Jewish customers? And so Nicole Flannery got in touch with an Orthodox Jewish man and asked him for some help in coming up with appropriate symbols and Hebrew lettering, Hebrew orthography, and they put that up there together. And it was done the Tuesday after the killing and people just stopped and stared. It became this monumental work of public art. It's still there and I, I love the idea that 30 years from now, kids will be inside having a Frappuccino and they'll see the reverse image of the, this art and, and ask someone, why is that there? And, as, and they will then learn the story of the 11 dead at Tree of Life. This is um, this is the sign on Forward Avenue leading into Squirrel Hill, and I just want to point out that little blue Star of David hanging from the H. That was one of thousands of little tiny Stars of David placed around not just Squirrel Hill, but all of Pittsburgh. They were collected from around the world by some volunteers utilizing a Facebook group, and then hung from statues, um, street signs, um, billboards, everything, and you could just see them everywhere. And a lot of them, some were made of popsicle sticks, some were knit or crocheted. This one is made of a kind of tinsel glitter paper. And a lot of the ones hanging from trees were, were made of that glittery paper. And so at night you could look up and see the street lights reflecting off of these stars of David. It was incredibly beautiful. I always like to show this photograph. I don't know who any of these people are, but they are Orthodox Jews accompanying a hearse with one of the dead bodies. This is significant because one of the interesting things about Squirrel Hill is that because of its history and its geography, the Orthodox, conservative, reform, and secular Jews all know each other fairly well. And so when tragedy happens, they come together and support each other. So here you see a bunch of Orthodox Jews walking with the hearse containing one of the dead, and none of the dead was Orthodox. Um, but it is traditional in Judaism that you guard the bodies from the moment they die until the moment they're put in the ground, any Jewish body, even if you die a peaceful death in your old age. You're not supposed to be left alone. And so shomrim or guards stay with you. They say psalms. They, they look after the body. And here are these Orthodox Jews acting as shomrim for somebody who's not from their specific Orthodox community. Just a, a beautiful act of solidarity that you'll see in one of these tight-knit neighborhoods like Squirrel Hill, but you don't see it as much in outside of a neighborhood like that. The, the money raised in the aftermath of the killing, a lot of people want to do something, um, and so they give. And they sometimes give to the, the synagogue itself, or they'll give to the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh. In this case, a guy named Shai Katiri, who is a lapsed Muslim, Iranian-American exile from Iran, hopes to become an American citizen. He's a grad student at Johns Hopkins. He woke up that morning. He lives in Washington, D.C. He found out what had happened. He went to his coffee shop, opened up a GoFundMe.org webpage to raise money for victims of the Tree of Life. It went viral. And within, I think it was about a week, he had raised a million and a half dollars. He is the largest single individual fundraiser for Pittsburgh Jewelry in the aftermath of this tragedy um, of, of anyone in the world. And again, he's like a 20-something a Muslim Iranian 
immigrant to the United States, no connection to Tree of Life, just has had many Jewish mentors and friends here, loves the Jews and wanted to help out. And that's the kind of thing that happens. Um, though that Starbucks you saw before was also the site where a dozen high school seniors from Taylor Alderdice High School, the public high school, less than a mile from the synagogue, um, gathered to plan a vigil that night. The grown-up vigil that, that was planned by the Jewish Federation, the kind of official memorial event, didn't happen until Sunday evening. But Saturday evening, these teenagers, mostly girls, um, pulled together a Havdalah service. Havdalah is the ceremony ending the Sabbath, so Saturday night. You use a, a, a three-stranded braided candle. You can see um, Emily Pressman holding such a candle. And they pulled it together. They got you know a stage. They got speakers. They got candles. They got everything. Um, in, they pulled it together in about six hours, um, entirely, as, you know, just on their own initiative. And it also was not only an interfaith group of teenagers, but an interracial group as well. Emily Pressman on the left there is a, from an observant Jewish family. Her friend uh, Isabel Izzy Smith is you know, not Jewish, uh, biracial, white, and black. They, these, these are college women now, but this was back when they were high school seniors. And they pulled together this event, if you can believe it. Thousands of people just a few hours after the mass killing pouring into the intersection of Forbes and Murray Avenues in the heart of Squirrel Hill, the historic crossroads of Squirrel Hill. And, you know, holding up candles, holding up flashlights on their phones, listening to songs, listening to prayers. And what's what you don't see in this photograph is where the photograph is taken from. It's taken from the steps of Sixth Presbyterian Church, the church that for about four decades was the home church of Reverend Frederick Rogers, known to most of us as Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. He was an ordained Presbyterian minister, though he, he did not practice, um, but he attended Sixth Presbyterian right across the street from the Jewish Community Center, which is also out of the frame. It's important to understand that when Mr. Rogers went to create um, a fictional idea of a safe neighborhood where children could play freely and lead, lead joyful lives both in reality and in fantasy remember because his his show takes place in both there's make-believe and there's the real world um to create that neighborhood he only had to look out his own window and base that neighborhood on his own home neighborhood of squirrel hill there was tension of course as there always is in the aftermath of a mass killing in this case a lot of the tension had to do with the presidential visit some people didn't want trump to visit some people did want him to ultimately rabbi jeffrey myers in the black hat the rabbi tree of life uh, did welcome the president against the wishes of some of his congregants. And here you can see them standing outside Tree of Life, right near um, the crosses for losses that Greg Zanus made. And you can see how he puts Jewish stars of David on the front of the crosses. So he's a Christian, but he's coming to be culturally sensitive to Jews. And then as a third layer, he wants to be specifically sensitive to the families of the dead. So he always paints the names of the dead on the front of the stars. So you can see Sylvan Simon on the left, Bernice Simon. They, by the way, were a married couple who had been married 60 years earlier in the room in which they were shot together. Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, and so forth. There was a protest against the, um, the presidential visit, and the protesters who were angry that Trump came chose a specifically Jewish way to express their, their horror or their grief. There is a, a ritual called Korea, which is the tearing of black cloth or fabric or a strip of paper. Traditionally, it's done when someone has died. You will safety pin a little black ribbon to your clothes and tear the ribbon as if you're rending your garments to express your, your horror, your grief, your sadness. They decide to do it when President Trump's motorcade came through Squirrel Hill. And so they handed out black pieces of paper. You can see that woman in the middle, right? The kind of auburn haired woman holding it up. My, 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 face, my eyes always go to her. She holding it up. And then when somebody gave a signal, they all went silent and tore those pieces of paper as if there were a tear in the fabric of the universe. Uh, some people were less subtle. Um, you know, this was not the rule by any means, but I do want to show that some people did bring, you know, angrier messages to the president. But there was only one arrest. It was a very, very peaceful protest. Um, this fellow, a, a University of Pittsburgh sociologist named Joshua Bloom, sat down in front of the presidential motorcade and refused to move and began praying and chanting and singing, and the police came and took him away. Uh, Professor Bloom was very clear with me that the police were gentle with him. They were, he felt that they were very professional and, and nice to him, in fact. He was released the next morning. No charges were filed, but that was the one arrest at the anti-Trump rally. It's not just presidents who come. Celebrities come in the aftermath of a mass killing. One of the things that happens is it becomes 
a, a magnet for famous people. And so here you see Tom Hanks, who um, I believe has become some sort of honorary chairperson of the fundraising campaign to rebuild the synagogue. He has his left arm around Joanne Rogers, the widow of Mr. Rogers. Now this, of course, is a, a slide that's gonna mean a lot to those of you who are NFL football fans. The, white, the, the beautiful head of luscious white hair uh, with its back to us is the head of Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots. When he, he came from an observant Jewish home himself, he's a religious Jew, and when he came to town, he, as many Jews did, would pay respects to the Tree of Life congregation, which would meeting in another building, but it was Tree of Life nonetheless. And when he came, he wore that yarmulke that says stronger than hate and has the Steelers logo with a Jewish star on it. And I took this photo, even though you're not supposed to take photographs on the Sabbath, because I thought, holy cow, there's the owner of the Patriots wearing Pittsburgh Steelers garb. When has that ever happened in history? I have to record it for posterity. So I took that picture. And uh, just two photographs left. This is a beautiful one. It's not just when we think about what comes in the aftermath of a mass killing, what have I talked about today? I've talked about public art. I've talked about money and fundraising. I've talked about politicians. I've talked about celebrities. And here I want to talk about um, furry four-legged friends, dogs. People brought their therapy dogs and support animals from all over. I talked to a woman from New Jersey, eight hours away, who found herself in Harrisburg, four hours, three hours or four hours from Pittsburgh, with her six dachshunds, each of them a trained therapy animal. She made contact with a nurse at Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh and who said, we would love to have your dogs here to help people heal. And she left the Harrisburg dog show and drove several more hours to Pittsburgh with her six dachshunds. That was not an unusual story. There were animals everywhere. This little girl is petting this big, beautiful pooch. Um, and you can see that she's holding a card she made for the Pittsburgh police. And if you read it, it says, look close. It says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe. Lily age six. And I always like to conclude with this photograph of Robert Zacharias. Robert Zacharias is a not particularly religious, uh, let's say, reformed Jew from New Jersey. He lives in Pittsburgh now, teaches at Carnegie Mellon University, teaches something very fancy in robotics that I don't understand um, as, a, as a humanist myself. And um, the day of the shooting, he heard about the vigil that the teenagers were planning at um, at the corner of Forbes and Murray, and he decided to go. And he reached into his closet to find a yarmulke, a, a kippah, a skull cap of the kind that Jews wear for religious occasions. And he put it on, and he went to that memorial. And afterwards, he was going to some party, you know, with friends, and he left the yarmulke on his head. And the next day, he decided to put it on again, and the day after that, and the day after that. And three years later, he is still wearing it. Now, he has not become uh, an Orthodox Jew by any means. Um, he is not, um, uh, I don't think he's changed his religious practice. What he is doing now is publicly identifying visually as a Jew. And to me, that's just symbolic of so many of the little things that happen around the peripheries of a mass killing like this, right? You have this extraordinary event of, of, of unmitigated pain and suffering and trauma and violence. And, and there's no question about that, right? And I, I don't mean to gainsay it or deny it or paint a rosy picture of it. It's not. I spent a lot of time listening to People talk about the worst thing that can happen to people. But in the aftermath, there are so many small little things that are more complicated than that, and in some cases are a little bit more hopeful than that. So here you have this guy, Robert Zacharias, who decides to make this little gesture in solidarity with his fellow Jews and sort of sticks, and that becomes part of who he is. You have a woman like Lynn Hyde, who's in my book, who had long thought of maybe converting to Judaism. And then when this happened, she actually heard the sirens going by her house. And when she found out what they were going to Tree of Life for, and she began thinking about it over the next few days, she began thinking more seriously about her conversion journey and ended up deciding to become a, a convert, a Jew by choice, which she has since done. Um, you have a woman also in my book, like Rose McKee, an African-American woman from the Twin Cities in Minnesota, who her tradition is when she hears about suffering, she likes to bake sweet potato pies for the people who have suffered and deliver them because she feels that's part of African-American culture and she can give that from her culture to, to people from another culture. So she wanted to make sweet potato pies for the, the Jews who had lost people at Tree of Life. But she knew somewhere in the back of her mind that Jews had special dietary restrictions, that they kept kosher. And so she actually went to the, the Jewish elementary school outside of Minneapolis and asked the teachers there 
could I use your kitchen and could you show me how to do this? And so she used their, she borrowed their kosher kitchen, which has been inspected by rabbis for, for kosher purity. And she got instructions on how to use kosher ingredients. And she made sure that these black, sweet potato pies were kosher and then flew them herself to Pittsburgh where she gave them to members of the three congregations that had lost people. So you have all of these little moments, the person who changes their appearance, the person who changes their religion, the person who delivers challah in the dead of night for no credit, doesn't ask for money or credit, just leaves them at people's doors, the person who flies in special kosher sweet potato pie, all of these things that give people some chance to recover, that give people that space, that psychic space to transcend suffering, I believe are more likely, having done the research I've done, to happen in a tight-knit historically Jewish community where the ethnic presence has been stable for so many decades, for a century. And that could be an ethnic presence of, of Black people, of, uh, of Hispanics, of Jews, of Muslims, uh, whatever, of queer people, right? When you have a community that has that kind of history, that depth, that stability, you have more points of contact of people who know how to help each other. And if someone comes in from the outside and says, I want to help, you have more people who can direct them to where their help is needed. America has had several hundred mass killings since Columbine in 1999. The FBI tracks mass killings as a special category because this is the United States and they have to. And in, I would say the majority of those mass killings, the people who are killed have nothing in common other than the fact that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They happened to be at the Cineplex, at the movie theater, or at the mall. And when that happens, their families don't know each other. They don't come from the same community. They might come from anywhere in a hundred mile radius around the mall. But when it comes to a place like Squirrel Hill and the people are from three houses of worship that needed one building and the neighborhood is such, is one of those dense, walkable, historic and urban neighborhoods where you can walk or bike. And in, the, in doing a 20 minute circuit, you can stop by the post office, the public library, the public high school, the kosher market, the non-kosher market, um, the, uh, you know, the library, the synagogues, the churches, the JCC, all of it, all walkable. It meant that in the days and weeks after this killing, in the year after this killing, people bumped into each other. They lived in real time, not virtual time, not internet time, but real time. They saw each other, they hugged each other, they did for each other. And it's little moments like that, that good, richly constructed, historical urban neighborhood living can provide, that give a community like the Jews of Squirrel Hill, and indeed any people, the opportunity in the aftermath of something terrible, not just to survive, but potentially to thrive. And that is the message I hope you take from my work. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm so excited to hear your thoughts and questions. Thank you, Mark. And that is a pretty good preface of the book. People, people. so I personally, I read the book in manuscript. It's changed in, 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 in a lot of ways that, uh, that were surprising and fantastic. And this time I listened to the audiobook, and that's really what I recommend people do because Mark reads it. And uh, in fact, these stories that we've only had 30 seconds or you know, a minute to talk about are really fleshed out. And maybe we'll have some opportunity to flesh out some of these stories. So um, I'm going to take the first question because, you know, I, I have the prerogative. It, it will do yeah. the floor. And you earned we'll, it, man. Yeah. And then, and then we'll go to it. But I, I've, I've said this before. I mean it still. Uh, I think you've achieved as important and as intimate a portrait of American Jews as Irving Howe captured in 1977 with World of Our Fathers, which was Thank about you. the Lower East Side in how it was on every Jewish bookshelf, and this belongs on every Jewish bookshelf, uh, for real. I don't know if people read it, and maybe they want to listen to the audio book like I did, but the, but the, but the actual paper belongs in the, in the house. Um, and uh, in, ha in, in Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers about the Lower East Side, you know, you're really thrown into the world of the Lower East Side. You get to really taste what the Kanish tastes like. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Squirrel Hill, uh, your book is a taste the Knish kind of a kind of a book. Uh, it's 21st century. Uh, you know, maybe the Knish is uh, now vegan. It's a little right. maybe, maybe they cut the carbs a little bit. But, you know, it's uh, and, and it maybe it's sweet potato pies, which is, uh, you know, that, that in fact, what you do would how did not do is the interaction between the different ethnicities 
on the ground. Because when you talked just now about the stability of a longtime Jewish community being being there. Well, you know, yeah, my wife, sorry to interrupt. My wife is from the Lower East Side. She's a third generation Lower East Sider. And um, she, she grew up in the same apartment that her grandparents lived in. And in 1920, the Lower East Side had half a million Jews. It was probably the largest concentration of Jews in the world in world history at the time in terms of sheer numeric volume. And I, I go to Lower East Side all the time now because my in-laws still live there and there are still Jews and there's still synagogues and maybe it's several tens of thousands, but it was once 500,000. And so it's interesting because that's a neighborhood that was, you know, it you could live entirely in Yiddish in on the Lower East Side, you know, on Grand Street in 1915 or 1920. And that was never the case in Squirrel Hill. You know, Squirrel Hill, the Jews moved in as a minority in that neighborhood. There were more Jewish neighborhoods, right? East Liberty in Pittsburgh was a more Jewish neighborhood. But Squirrel Hill, when it was settled, and it was settled fairly late, again, around the time of World War One. earlier than that, the, it's, it's, it's elevated. And trolleys actually couldn't get up there. You couldn't settle it until, until the technology was good enough to really build there because it's, it's, it's hilly. And, um, you know, it never became majority Jewish, even though Jews who grew up there feel like it was uh, because they knew so many Jews. And it was such a, a wonderful, um, idyllic neighborhood for them. But it, Jews there always had to relate to Gentiles and always had to, I mean, in fact, you know, um, it, is an, it is a neighborhood that looks a great deal like the United States in terms of having an African-American minority, an East Asian minority, a South Asian minority, white, non-Jews, Gentiles, right? It actually is, um, there's an outsized number of Jews compared to the rest of the country, but by and large, it is a neighborhood where people have to get along across across identity lines, and it, and it always has been. So that that heritage also goes very deep. Oh yeah, and that that is so evident and so twenty first. That's the tw that gives it the twenty first century feel of the book. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know what? We have questions here that are piling up, and so I can ask. I can always text you with my questions. So <laughs> let's um, let's look here. What we have going on? Are, are you able to actually see the Q and A? Um, yeah, oh, sure. Uh, w w um, well, first of all, we have the the second one here from Jeff Mulliver, I'm a Squirrel Hill native and was in Squirrel Hill that fateful weekend and attended the Saturday night vigil at Forbes and Murray. Uh, and in fact, you apparently, Jeff, you talked to Mark on the phone um, and he wants to know if we can make you an honorary Yinzer. So. Sure, so uh, for people who don't know, um, <laughs> the traditional Pittsburgh accent, which is harder and harder to find uh, you would say, you know, Yin's guys, are you, are Yin's guys going to the Steelers game? And um, you, you don't hear a lot of Yin's anymore, but a Yinzer is somebody, <laughs> so, so there's a very funny, in the in the Episcopal Cathedral in, um, I guess it's in East Liberty, um, not in Squirrel Hill, um, but there's, there's a, they sell a t-shirt there, you know, so in the, in Christian liturgy, you know, there's a lot of call and response, the Lord be with you and also with you. There's a lot of, and also with you. And there's a t-shirt that says, and also with Yin's. <laughs> and I just thought it was so brilliant. But I look, I mean, you know, my dad is from there. So I, I like to think that the that the Yinzerhood passes through the the lineage, but you know, but probably not. Probably if you don't grow up there, if you don't grow up on on, you know, the yellow and the black, right? The sports teams, then you're probably you I probably have no claim. Uh but but thank you. Thanks for the thought. We have a really good question from Melinda Blum. So Apparently, there's a recent book called by D Dara Horn called "People Love Dead Jews," which right. explores ways in which the idea of Jewish victimhood in public imagination can contribute to the diminishment of and dehumanization of living Jewish people. Now, I sure. know that you are really you're really careful not to do that here. Can you talk about how you thought about those kinds of issues well, as you were going through this? Let me first of all say that I think Dara, Dara Horn's book is terrific. Um, and I was going to say, if you read two books this year, hers should be one of them. <laughs> if this, the second book you should read this year should be Dara Horn's. Uh, but I know she's a terrific novelist, uh, a brilliant, you know, speaker and reader of Hebrew and Yiddish, a genius um, in some ways. And and this book, which is atypical for her in that it's nonfiction, is quite quite good. And yes, she's largely looking outside the United States at other countries. There's a, there, a lot of the world has a lot of tourism centered around dead Jews. So, you know, the like you can go to a lot of countries and there will be an almost museum like uh, quality, a Plymouth plantation like quality to um, or a plantation plantation like quality to like 
look at this neighborhood where you know the one Jews once lived here, and you know, they'll have little plaques. You know, this was the synagogue, and this was the house that the rabbi lived in, whatever. And they don't mention you know dot 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 until they were all murdered, or until they were driven from town, or until they were taken away in trains to the concentration camp. But they make money on it. The non-Jews living there now. Um, love to celebrate their Jewish past. It's quaint, it's kitschy, it's it's good for tourism, but they don't actually want real Jews living among them. And um, and her book was largely about how that went down, how that goes down in Europe. Um, but it certainly is the case in America that there are a lot of people who whose hearts are very touched, who's, who are moved easily. And by the way, this is probably also true, not just to, for Jews, but they, they are probably the same kind of people who are very moved by, you know, a dead black person or, you know, a dead, you know, whatever, anyone who don't necessarily want to live next to that person, right? And um, you, I'll just speak in terms of my own community, but others can speak in terms of theirs, that, um, that yes, there are people who are tremendously moved by these murders, but, um, but are kind of grossed out by Orthodox Jews, you know, wouldn't want a bunch of black hatted Orthodox moving into the neighborhood and are very, very, you know, um, you know, and definitely have a double standard when it comes to how they view actions by Jews or actions by the Jewish state of Israel or what compared to how they would view, say, actions by, you know, Chinese or Brazilians or whatever. Um, and you see that, and you see that people whose standard for dead Jews is different from their standard for, for living Jews. Um, how did it contribute to my book? You know, not at all. I mean, I have to tell the story I have to tell, and I have to tell it honestly. And you just have to trust as a writer that if you if you write what you see and try to write it well and fairly, that people will use your book for, in some cosmic sense, for good. But you can't worry about that when you're writing the book. Okay, so um, we have a couple more questions. I think that I'm going to combine a couple to sort of put it together. You've you spent a lot of time there. The book mm -hmm. st starts on day one, essentially, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. your trips there were numerous over the course of mm -hmm. the next year, and you record all the way through the anniversary at the end. So two things. One is um, there were some Jews from New York, Philadelphia, elsewhere, who started showing up being expert Jews to sort of tell the, hick, the hicks right. how to do things. That I found absolutely fascinating and would like you to speak about that a little bit. But also we have a question from Eileen Rubenstein who says, who has a question, has the, the feeling that were engendered within the Pittsburgh Jewish community, has that remained or has there been, yeah. has it, or have there been two, since? two really good questions. So the first one I'll take is, yeah, I'll just, I'll just expand on that a little bit, Michael. Uh, I was, you know, both charmed and horrified and, and ultimately amused by the effort of some groups, um, some disaster response organizations from Brooklyn um, made up of Orthodox Jews who, who drove to Pittsburgh immediately and said, let us show you how to how to bury your dead, because there are specifically Jewish ways that you do funeral, that you do the cleaning of bodies and burials and funerals. So when, for example, you have a body, a body that has been killed violently, one of the things you have to do before you bury a body is ensure that um, it is clean, that there's no blood on it, no mucus, um, no other bodily fluids, right? You have to, and the body has to be cleansed with, with water, um, which is poured over it, and you say psalms when you do it, and it's a very spiritual thing that's done by specially trained people. Pittsburgh has those specially trained people in their community, right? Indigenous to that, to the Pittsburgh Jewish community. And there were these Jews who showed up from one of these society, what they're, they're called um, burial societies, literally Hever Kaddish is a holy society, but really it's a burial society. There were these New York burial societies that showed up and said, we know how to handle like mass death events. We know how to handle violent deaths. We know to handle gunshot wounds. You don't know. And the Pittsburghers had to send them away, had to send them packing and say, we'll figure it out. What we, we do know and what we don't know we'll learn and we wanna bury our own. And it was very moving how they stood up for themselves there as kind of these Midwestern yokels, so to speak, in the face of these very um, cocksure and certain New Yorkers. Um, that kind of spirit to link to what you were saying, that sort of come together spirit, because it was a, a sort of intra-religious, Orthodox, conservative, reform, secular community of Pittsburghers who buried their dead. Um, no, in a very good way, Pittsburgh Jewry feels pretty different now because 
the good news is that um, if if grieving and mourning succeed, then people return not to normal, but in, increasingly closer to normal, right? The, the goal of healthy grief and healthy mourning is to not stay in that height, heightened state of weeping in each other's arms and hugging each other forever. The goal is to get to use that, get through it and return to normal life with its normal annoyances and its normal, you know, you yell at the kids for this and you get mad when the dog chews up your sofa and you lose your temper over trivial things because you're caught in a traffic jam and you have road rage and all of that stuff of life is, un, you know, it is an achievement to have normal annoyances rather than to continue to live in the world of disaster and disaster response, disaster preparedness. That's no way to live. And so actually what's very moving about Pittsburghers and Pittsburgh Jewry is that is, is how much they seem to have snapped back to the kind of fundamentally normal and decent existence that they had before. I think that that is, I mean, besides being somewhat the point of, the, of, of your observations, a great place to, for us to, to say thank you. Um, there are more questions here, but they're going to, folks are going to have to go to the audio book to get their answers. Well, um, I also want to say, I, let me just say that my, my email is, uh, is in the book. Anyone who, who reads it and has a question, I respond to every, I get, I'm getting mail every day now from people who, uh, who have read it. And I always love hearing. For, so if there's something that really you still want to talk about, um, I, this is very much a passion project for me. Pittsburgh was a passion project. Um, Jewry and and response to hate in all of its forms, and I know that Jews are not um, are not alone, um, hardly alone, far from alone in America in responding to this. And it's it's um, it's our story in the midst of uh, of a country in which groups in which every group has its own story, and we have to be talking to each other. So I want to I want to thank you and this lecture for enabling that. Yeah, and uh, and and you. One of our questions asked, at what point did you start? interviewing Gentiles and understanding how important a part of the, the story they were. And actually, I'd like to ask that because did you go there thinking that you were going to interview basically the Jewish community or did you recognize? I never, I never think that. Even when I'm writing about Jews, I always feel like the story is not just contained to any one group. I mean, those of you who listen to this podcast that we do, Unorthodox, know that one of our regular features is the Gentile of the week, because I always felt it was important. When we started this podcast seven years and, and seven million downloads ago, um, I told my co-hosts, we can't just be about Jews. We, we are a Jewish voice to our world and the non-Jewish world. So no, I always, I mean, I probably my first half dozen interviews were with Jews, but very quickly, you know, I was interviewing 20 to 30 percent non-Jews um, in the community because also how are you going to understand the interrelationships and the and the the communal response? And I mean, I'm actually heartbroken at some of the the extraordinary Gentile allies who didn't make it into that book. If you would ask me what do I most regret about the book, I would talk about some of the Gentile allies from other faith communities, from other races, from other ethnicities that didn't make it into the book. But you know, so it goes. Yeah, it, it feels encyclopedic as it is, so I can't imagine more, but it was, it's unbelievable. So every, this is one of the, this is, as I said, one of the great works of the 21st century regarding the American Jewish experience. And uh, it's, you know, I'm so, you know, so happy to have you as our inaugural uh, Thank speaker you. for this, for this lecture series on hate genocide and ethnic cleansing in the name of uh, Mark Rubin. We are now going to actually uh, turn to, to Pam Rubin um, to sort of close this out. And so I will, uh, I'll remind everyone that tonight is Purim. So you are not just, a, uh, you're not just allowed, but you're required to go get loaded now. So you can start hitting the, the liquor cabinet right about now. And uh, it's, a, it's a holiday to celebrate the victory of, of over hate and tyranny. And every age suffers in hate and tyranny Ours is not excluded from this axiom of history that seems to repeat itself. And yet we must uh, also allow ourselves at least brief moments in celebration of lives that are victorious over tyranny. And so I wanna conclude the evening's events in celebration of Mark Rubin's life and his contribution, uh, who was, a, Mark was a seven-year-old, he was a six-year-old when he was brought into the, uh, into, the, into Theresienstadt with his family. And he was a seven-year-old who emerged from behind the gates of that Nazi concentration camp uh, to, uh, to and, he and he was a living example of the victory over, over tyranny. 
and how life can be lived uh, in the ashes. So uh, now a concluding work from Pam Rubin, his now his widow, now for over a year, and always Pam, a great friend of our work at UCR in our mutual hope to help foster real thinking and sometimes moral feeling among the students and the future leaders of California. So Pam, if you could join us uh, to conclude. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank everyone who's watched this. Um, it's been an amazing opportunity for me, especially because this lecture series is in memory of my husband, who was a Holocaust survivor and he was imprisoned in Terezin. Um, he came to this country in 1948 with his mother and his brother. Um, his father came a year later and they, they settled in New York. My father-in-law came in 1949 and ultimately in 1953, he came to California. Now I'm a born and raised West Los Angeles girl. I come from a completely Jewish family, but not observant in any way, shape or form. So um, when I met my, my future husband and I went for Shabbat dinners and those continued uh, for many years until uh, probably 10 or 12 years till my in-laws made Aliyah to Israel. Um, there were people always around the table and they spoke different languages. My sister-in-law was from England. So she and I were the only true English speaking people. There was Slovak and German and Hungarian and Hebrew, many, many languages. And what I found out through my years of being his wife was that we were invited many times to weddings and bar mitzvahs and celebrations. And these people were just, they're no, they weren't relatives. And so what happened was the survivors that ended up in Southern California, especially as we refer to it as the other side of town, because I live on the West side and this was a little bit farther East. Um, the survivors had no survivors of their families, maybe one or two, maybe none, maybe no brothers, no sisters, no cousins, no grandparents. And so all of these people in that, in that neighborhood, just like Squirrel Hill, became family to all the other survivors because they had nobody else. And in the early 1970s, um, there was a periodical that was being published in Orange County by a gentleman named Louis Carto. And he, he was a denier of the Holocaust. And he had this periodical called, was published from the Institute for Historical Review. And he just denied everything. And a gentleman, um, a man that we knew in the early 70s, his name was Mel Mermelstein. He came to speak to the Jewish survivor communities in, in La Brea, Melrose and La Brea, um, in Beverly Hills, um, in Beverly Wood, anywhere where there was a congregation of Jews that held older Jews and Jewish survivors. And he said to them, some of you won't be able to, but some of them, some of you have to, you must speak. You must tell people what happened to you, what happened to your families, where you ended up. And if you don't speak, then the deniers will win. And so that was the beginning of the rumblings of creating the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and um, in 1983, my husband and I went to Washington, D.C. We took my mother-in-law, my father-in-law had passed away, and we went with some other friends. Also, he was a survivor. And we met other survivors that they knew, but they'd lived in New York. And during that, that four-day event, the United States government gave the Holocaust Committee the property to build the museum. And it took 10 years, but we were very successful. And the building opened in 1993. And my daughter, Michelle, who was um, you working there then, was working in DC and Mark and I were there for the opening and we had tickets. And the day before was beautiful. All the cherry blossoms had bloomed. And that night there was a concert at the, what's the name of the, the Kennedy Center in DC. 
And um, it was very, we thought it was gonna be somewhat uplifting, but it was very dirge-like. And everybody, all, all the ladies had brought their finest spring wear. And when we went into the theater, and it was lovely, when we came out, it was raining and no one was prepared for the rain. And the next morning you had to be in your seat, in your section, three hours before the, the, uh, the, the event started. And the seats were wet, everything was wet. It was cold, it was cloudy. And when Ellie Wiesel was called up to the podium with President Clinton, and he was accepting the, the opening of the Holocaust Museum. It was like, it was, it was unbelievable. The clouds parted and the sun came out. Huh? Oh, and there was a rainbow. And, you know, you just have to see that and understand because the survivors were so afraid that people wouldn't believe them. And the people who were in the camps, they wouldn't believe that there was ever a thing like that. And on the outside of the Holocaust Museum, I'll just paraphrase, it was said by um, General Eisenhower to his aide. And he, it's, he said, take all the pictures you can, document what you see, because in 20 years, they won't believe it happened. And so here we are, nothing is new. Nothing is different. And through education, like with this Jewish studies program at UCR, I just wanted Jews to have a voice at the, on that campus. And I just wanna thank you all for participating. And my husband taught myself and my children one thing, don't let anybody ever do this to you. Thank you so much, it's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. Pam, hey, thank you so much for those words and for giving us our permission to use Mark's name uh, for this work. And, uh, and as you say, it's uh, documenting it so that it can be believed is, is a lot. And, uh, and that's why I'm particularly pleased that we had Mark Oppenheimer here, just such a fine journalist who captured the moment uh, in a way that, uh, is very, uh, uh, it, you, you have to hear it yourself. So thanks everyone. We are gonna call it an evening.